social media platforms are exploding all over the web and influencers on those platforms are generating millions of views with their content. Inconceivable. How does any business or social media manager stay on top of what's trending and continue to grow the business? On today's show, we're interviewing one of social media's pioneers and mega influential, mega influential leaders, Jay Bear, and he's going to dive deep with us to discover what's trending in social media and how you can leverage it for your business. Stay tuned. It's the Social Media Lab Lounge Live. Are you ready to use science to bust some myths in the social media ecosystem? Great Scott! Welcome to the Social Media Lab Live, brought to you by Agoracle. Where our social media scientists experiment on real accounts to crack the code on social media success for your business. Dive five to subscribe to the show. Now your hosts, Owen Video and Scott Ayers. Hey, welcome back to the Social Media Lab Lounge Live, where social media professionals get to bust the myths, the rumors, and the stories of social media marketing with science. We are live every Wednesday at 9 a.m. PST, streaming both on Facebook and on YouTube like a boss. And you can join the tribe when you fall. Give me five. That's right. Type five right down below to join the Social Media Lab Lounge, where you get insider access, contribute to the show, and so much more in our private Facebook group for social media nerds. Just type five for in the comment section. Now, I'm Owen Video, your host, MC, and the number one social media scientist, Scott Ayers, is at a conference today. It's true. It's true. We are we are going to miss him today. And but we have a very special guest today. I am super excited about our guest today. He's a Hall of Fame speaker, New York Times best-selling author, and the most inspirational expert on market, marketing, customer experience, and customer service. His name is Jay Bear. We're going to bring him on in just a quick second. But I want to say hello to all of our friends watching us today on the YouTube's Want to say what's up to Lil that you guys are here today. I want to hear from you in the comment section. Jay's a guy who has not only built a tremendous uh, personal brand for himself as a recognized speaker and an author, but he's also grown businesses. This guy has worked in the space of social media for such a long time, and he knows how to grow a business, and he knows the struggles that we go through as social media managers. So I want you to use this time today to ask Jay anything and type those questions in the comment section below. Now, if you don't, here's the thing. If you don't ask questions, then I'm going to be asking all the questions. And I have like 27 questions that I want to ask Jay. It's true. Only two of them reference his bank account, but for the most uh, everything else is pretty legitimate. And I want you guys to, uh, I want you guys to know that. But right now, please, uh, without further ado, I want you to, to welcome our guest today. He is a Hall of Fame speaker, a New York Times best-selling author, and one of the kindest men you will ever meet. Welcome, my friend to the show, Jay Bear. Jay, great to have you on. Thanks for making time for us today. Owen, video, always so spectacular to be with you, my friend. Good to see you on the mend. I'm sorry that Scott's not here because he's clearly the better as duo, but we will make do. We will persevere. <laughs> we will press on yeah. and talk about all things. So along those lines is from uh, Tom Webster, who's a, a true genius and uh, podcast expert at Edison. And he says that the plural of anecdote is not data. And I think that is a very good guiding principle uh, for us all. So often in social media, we tell ourselves stories and, and, and we believe those stories are math and that's not yeah. the same thing. And that's why what the what social media lab does is uh, so vitally important. You know, um, we, I think it's easy to get caught up in the storytelling, um, you know, sort of culture, right? Storytelling culture where it becomes more about the testimonial, you know, that's that you heard from someone than it is about, but does that actually work? And, and I think that's the big inspiration for the show. And I think that our audience enjoys it as well. Do you guys like hearing about the latest science? Uh, let me know in the comment section below. Jay, you've done tons, tons of stuff in the industry. I mean, wow, uh, you've written tons of books. What was your favorite book, uh, the, the, the most favorite book that you've written? I mean, the favorite book is always the most recent book. It's sort of like children. Uh, <laughs> but I, I would say that, that um, 
you know, the book that probably has still the the greatest impact on a lot of people is Utility, uh, which which was all about making your marketing helpful yeah. uh, and and really focusing on, on useful. It really was sort of a, a prototypical content marketing book before we all took that to be gospel. So there's yeah. still a lot of people who, who use those principles uh, in their business every day. So from a book writing experience, um, do you find that your process changes from from book to book or do you have like this solid, you know, J bear system for muscling out of uh, yeah. out of book and and cranking it out? Yeah, that's an interesting question. It's it's um each one's a little different for sure. Uh but especially like the mo my most recent book Talk Triggers, which I wrote with Love my that. good friend Daniel Lemon. So Loved when you have it. a co-author and I had a co-author on my first book, The Now Revolution, the amazing Amber Nasland wrote that book with me. So when you have a co-author by definition process and, and and collaboration schema, et cetera, but there is definitely a, a way that that I tend to write my parts of the book, which first and foremost, Owen, is that all of my books start off as a speech. So what happens is yeah. I'm in this process right now. I come up with something that I think, you know, a lot of that a little bit, and, and I'll write a, a keynote speech about that topic, and I'll take that on the road and do it for a year mm -hmm. uh, and, and do that speech 40 times or something. Wow. And, and, and if it gets to the point where I'm like, this feels like it's going well, the audience likes it, uh, I have the story sort of um, – uh, perfected and there's a there's a beginning in the middle and then there's a narrative then uh, then I'll turn it into a book but it, mm -hmm. but it always goes that sequence which is actually the opposite for how most people do it most people will write a book and then they write a speech based on the book I write a speech and then write a book based on the speech uh, so that's just kind of the way I've always done it and and yeah. uh, as a consequence I think a lot of my books have a little bit more of a narrative flow to them than sure. than some of the others because you know you can't you can't do a speech without that Talk Triggers uh, was the latest Jay Bear book that I've read, but in, in twice in my life, um, your books have have created milestones or peaks in in my in my business. And the first one, I believe, was uh, Utility. It was it was about being there for the customer, more customer service based. Um, followed that more mm -hmm. like a, a textbook and began to service my customers in in a more of a radical way, like this kind of really and really to the best of our ability. Um, truth be told it was like the best we could do with what we had but making a really conscious effort and we saw a huge spike there in our retention uh which of course was was great for yeah. our revenue but talk triggers as well i got talk triggers I think, on I audio think example of the, what's that i was gonna say i think you're a great example i think you're a great example of the utility premise which is take everything you know and, and give it away uh, right well while certainly people um, are encouraged to, to pay uh, you for your extraordinary video expertise, much of what you know, much of what you have learned, much of the work that you do for your clients, you give away for free one bite at a time. So if you want to sum sure. up kind of the utility philosophy, it is this, give away information snacks mm -hmm. in order to sell knowledge meals. Yeah. And, Ooh, and I think you do a really, a really good job of that. Um, and, and a lot of people still don't do that, even though I wrote the book, uh, be, because they are afraid of, yes. um, of giving away their secret sauce or, yes. or, or whatever. And it's like, bro, there is no secret sauce anymore. Uh, and, and I think that the important point to all of this is that a list of ingredients doesn't make somebody a chef. There you go. Right. And, and, wow. You know, I've been doing this a long time. I am deceptively youthful looking. It's the soft lighting here, but uh, it is. It's excellent. One thing I've learned in my long career, um, the one thing I've learned is that if, if you've got a potential customer, okay, and they are thinking about either A, pay you what, or B, watching a bunch of your videos and doing it themselves, mm -hmm. I got to tell you, that's probably not an ideal customer anyway. Yeah, good. So just let them do that. Just let them DIY it, man. Yeah. And you know, I think that DIY, I have a bathroom sink that will attest to this. Um, starting DIY is a great way to happily hire someone to do it for you. You know what I mean? So my my philosophy has kind of been on that same model. It's just like, I am going to overwhelm you <laughs> with content um, so that you break your your bathroom sink and then you want to call, you want to call yeah. a professional. Um, and, uh, can you yeah, relate? Has you that, you've it, seen that? I, went to, I was, yeah, I was at an event that when, this is before I even wrote the book. And actually the first chapter of utility mentions this, uh, this case study, because it was that long ago. 
I was at an event many years ago and uh, Robert Stevens was the, the keynote. Robert Stevens was the founder of Geek Squad. Yeah. And, and he was talking of, about the value of content. And this is before content marketing was, was even a term. We didn't even call it that. And somebody in the audience, this was in uh, Palm Springs, as I recall, uh, raised their hand and, and asked a really smart question. He'd been talking about their YouTube channel, uh, which had dozens and dozens of of very helpful videos on it. And this person uh, raised their hand and said, uh, Robert, thanks for being here. Great speech. So it seems to me that Geek Squad is in the business of, of fixing things for money. And he's like, yeah, that's, that's probably a good summary. Yet you have all these videos that show people how to fix things themselves. How does that make business sense? Yeah. And Robert Stevens said, our very best customers are those who believe initially that they can fix it themselves. Yeah. Because maybe they can the first time, right? But then the second time they get overconfident and they screw it up and they oh, got to yeah. call Geek Squad because they've completely deactivated their own network or in your case, uh, you know, ruined a bathroom sink. And, and so uh, you've probably heard of the curse of expertise, the curse yeah. of knowledge. And uh, that, that's very true. Oh my goodness gracious. Well, I'm glad to know that I'm on the same track as the, uh, the geek squad guys. You know what I mean? That gives me some hope, some hope yeah. for the future. I want to know what is your hope for this interview with Jay Bear, Scott Cabell, Colin C. Cottrell, April Shinar, and Joseph Woods. Good to have you out there. Air 5 to you. Ryan Perry, Tolis Dokianos logging in from one, one of the European countries. I know you're, you're a world traveler there, Tolis. Great to see you. Rena Romano, Marco Novo, my man Chris Romero. And Alicia Way the third. Good to have you guys out there. Whether you're watching us on the Agora Pulse channel or on one of our watch parties, we're stoked to have you here. We're interviewing Jay Bear, and we're talking about what's trending in social media and how you can take advantage of it. Because it's one thing to know where the trends are, right, Jay? But it's another thing entirely. Like, how do I capture that? You know, convert it into you know, something that works for my business and then distribute it while at the same yeah. time acquiring uh, new customers. And uh, we're going to get into that and we're going to get into that in just a quick second. But first, we want to give a big shout out to our sponsors today at Agorapulse.com. Our show today is powered by Agorapulse, the number one social media management tool for social marketers and small business. Do you want to schedule posts, respond to comments, and get more customers all from one easy to use interface? I love it. Every Everything is all in that interface right there. And I can respond to my YouTube comments. I can respond to tweets. I can respond to, to really every comment on my social media platform. And you can too. Just go to getagorapulsenow.com. Getagorapulsenow.com. Start your free trial. Type in the code LIVE and your first month is free. Toss your old garbage, disgusting software away. Get rid of it. Just trash it and start your free trial of Agora Pulse today. Jay, we're talking about social media. What's big right now, man? Like what you're traveling all over the world. You're delivering speeches. Um, you're talking to the business leaders. What is big? What is trending right now that every social media manager needs to be aware of? It's super interesting. We're starting to actually see big companies even B companies start to wonder if maybe they should get on the TikTok that the that the tipping Ooh. point is is here and that that should be the new place that they uh, participate in and the virality quotient on TikTok is unbelievable. Yeah, uh, if you've spent any time there, it 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 is uh, far more addictive, I think, even than than Instagram or Snap, just the way the interface works. Yeah. Um, and, and so you're starting to see a tremendous amount of time being spent. They're obviously still uh, skewing younger, but like all social networks, that, that may change, right? Everything starts young uh, and then gets older as adoption grows. And so a lot of our enterprise clients at Convince and Convert, we work with a lot of big companies around the world, are starting to say, hey, is it, is it time to, to start exploring there? Uh, and, and it may very well be, but it is very much one of those platforms where yeah. if you are a company yeah. and you want to try and, and build awareness on TikTok, it really has to be content driven, right? It can't be an ad. It can't be a promotion. Mm -hmm. It needs to be something that's that's indirect or uh, off to the side of what your core value proposition is. We call that marketing sideways, okay. uh, where it's not really about you. It's, it's about something that your audience is interested in. It yes. just happens to be produced 
uh, by you. For this is a good example, right? Uh, you know, Agora Pulse isn't actually in the social media testing business, right? Right? They're in the social media software business, but the lab generates things that are of interest to their core customers, right? So it's a good example of this marketing sideways uh, uh, principle. You know, I run into this all the time, especially with our clients that want to get on YouTube. It's it's like I need to be selling my product 100% of the time. Otherwise, sort of this freeze happens, right? There's kind of like this, ah, I don't know what to do. Um, how do you, do you have a process for sort of looking at what's trending and then converting it into something that will work for a business? And how do you do that? Converting which to a business? So you're looking at TikTok. Let's take TikTok as an example. And it's like, okay, TikTok sure. is big, yep. but then how do we put our business on it, right? Because you get you get oh, sort of like it. the CMO yeah. and the marketer is like, oh, do I have to throw buckets yeah, of paint sure. at my cat oh my and, and that sort of thing? So how do we do that, Jay? I mean, it's this is this is the, the one true question about social media because right. the more things stay the same, the more things change. I mean, there, there is no, what we always say to our clients, like if you have a social media strategy that's that's older than 15 months, you don't actually have a strategy at all. You might as well light it on fire. Oh, wow. Uh, because things change that quickly. But, but just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do that thing. And, yeah. and I think that's where we where we get led astray. We focus so much on the tactics and and the new things. One of my favorite lines to use is when people say, Jay, what's the hot new thing? Yeah. I always have the same answer, Owen, which is doing today better. That's the hot new thing, right? Doing today and, better. And yeah, just fo focus on on results. And that's where we when we start to think, hey, should we spend time on TikTok? Well, here's how I answer that question. I get that question every day. Mm -hmm. Should we go to TikTok? I say, okay. Maybe um, if if your audience is there, which is no given, if you have a compelling content strategy, and most importantly, if you're going to go do things on TikTok, what are you going to stop doing as a consequence? Okay, that's big. See, one of the problems that we have in social media, yeah, we, we have a problem in social media, which is what we think we have an ever-expanding um, uh, size of backpack, right? right? So, hey, I can spend time on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn uh, and Snap Twitter. So I'm already in six places. And sure, I'll just add a seventh place. Right. Well, no that big deal. doesn't actually work. Because right. by definition, what that means is that at some other six, you're going to do shittier. So you either need to say, hey, I'm going to do TikTok. I'm going to do less of X. Or you need to have some sort of scheme for getting a resources. And so a lot of our clients are um, VP marketing, VP digital. Those are the kind of folks that we work with day to day at Convince mm -hmm. and Convert. Yeah. And their boss, the CMO, walks into their office and says, how come we're not on TikTok? And I train our clients to That's always good. say the same thing. Okay. We would love to be on TikTok. What would you like me to stop? Yeah. Oh, oh my God. That's huge, guys. I want to hear from you in the comment section right now. What does that mean to you? Where have you experienced that you know, in your life where the boss says, why aren't we doing this? And your response again, Jay Bear, you, the response you teach your clients to say is, what would you like me to stop? Huge. That's massive. You know, we just had a conversation today as a team um, about YouTube because we're, we're growing like, like three YouTube channels, starring me, right? So not even and on top of managing the clients that we're right. teaching to build channels. And, you know, I kind of reached this place. I don't know how many of you guys saw my story yesterday uh, where I had this whole like hospital thing. That's why I'm wearing my stronger shirt today because I'm stronger today than I was yesterday. Um, where, you know, I'm sitting down with my wife and my team this morning and I'm like, we cannot uh, do all the things that, that I thought we could do, right? There, there just has to be a decision made on the content that's really going to propel us forward. But what I really love that you said, Jay, is about training your, your, your customers on what to say to their, uh, to their boss. How does, the, how does the CMO react? I mean, I think a lot of us kind of like, we, we want to say it like, I told him where to shove it. Did you really? No, but I, you know, I will next time. You know, how, how can we expect the CMO or the head of the company that we work for to respond when we say something maturely, but responsibly, but sternly like that. Yeah. No, it's actually 
um, and maybe I'm just fortunate in the client mix that we have, but I, I find that CMOs typically really understand that because they have the same challenge. The CEO comes into their office yeah. and says, how come we're not doing more field marketing? Yeah. And if that person is smart, they will say, okay, what would you like me to stop doing? Or gotcha. great, what's the additional budget for marketing in order to now launch a field marketing strategy? Um, so, so usually these good CMOs kind of understand that there is a set number of resources and, and you can, you can split the pie, uh, into smaller and smaller pieces, but, but that means you get less pie, uh, in, in each, in each slice. Now I will tell you though, Owen, um, and everybody out there, and thanks for tuning in you guys, um, that, that one of the problems that we have in the social media community is still, you know, what are we now 10 12 10 12 15 years into this ride yeah for sure we're still typically pretty bad pretty bad at documenting how long things take okay so one of the challenges we have especially mid-size and large organizations is 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 we know because we're social media practitioners at some level that to say hey now we're going to go be on tiktok that requires uh, a developing a content strategy mm -hmm. uh, b creating and it's all video it's looping it's got to be funny so you're probably going to need multiple takes you can't just run and gun it you got to monitor comments you got to build an audience you got to right. look at analytics right so you know we understand that that is a meaningful amount of time mm -hmm. but still to this day i don't think a lot of marketing executives who dabble in digital but don't do social permanently do not understand still in 2020, how long social media takes. Right. So my advice to all of you out there, if you have a boss, get into the habit of keeping a timesheet, get into the habit of keeping track of how long media things take. That's big. Because when you ultimately get into this conversation with your boss and, and she says, well, it's not gonna be that big of a deal, just add TikTok on top of what you're already doing. <laughs> you need to be able to say, the last time we added a channel, it was 22 hours of planning and then, you know, nine hours to spin it up. And then it's like, you know, seven hours a week. So consequently, that's an 87 hours. Where do you want me to take those from? If yeah. you don't have the numbers, it just becomes a he said, she said. And then the CMO thinks, well, maybe you guys just aren't working hard enough or aren't working fast enough. Right. And that's a hard argument to win. So yeah. even maybe you'll never need it. Maybe you'll never need it, but you probably will someday. Trust me. Just get in the habit of documenting how long your stuff takes. That's huge. Uh, that's huge. I know, you know, I've run into the same problem uh, where I'm, I'm taking on too much. How many of you have taken on too much? And here, tell us what happened. Tell us what was the additional project that you took on that just was the the straw that broke the, the camel's I back. I could do a whole show on this, on things that I decided to do that were a bad idea. You know, if, if you do that show, I want 10%. I'm just, I'm just saying, cause it, it incepted here. It's, it's, is that, is that fair? So, right. so you can text the mail, brother. Yeah, exactly. We'll have the waivers out to you, uh, out to you shortly. Hey, so let me ask you this. Do we go big on what's big or do we stay in our lane and focus on what we're good at? Let me give you an example. Like, you know, let's say that I've got a bicycle company. We've been a bicycle company for 150 years. And, um, you know, all things being equal, we've got a, a marketing team and, and they're, they're good at, at, at their jobs, uh, but no one's a star video. No one's a star podcaster. No one's even maybe a star graphic designer. All, all things are kind of equal there, right? In, in that situation, do we, do we look at what's trending and, and do we like double down on it saying, okay, I want TikTok's customers of tomorrow, right? Those are the customers of tomorrow and I want them today, or I want, I want the build relationship with them today. Or, or do we just keep blogging and keep doing the SEO and like stay where we're good, stay doing what has always worked? Like where's the line between doing something new and, and getting better at what you're already good at? I can't really answer that because the, the question should be, why are we doing this at all? Okay. So when, when we get hired to do social media strategy, the first question we ask our potential clients is, Convince me that you should spend even one dollar on social media from this day forward. Wow. Are you talking about ads or, or just even like employees and hiring period. and that? Why do you even have accounts? Why don't you just take them all down? Why don't you just literally disconnect every account? Okay. Um, because the goal is not to be good at social media. The goal is to be good at business because of social media. Okay. And there are a lot of ways to do that. Oh, and you can use social to, to attract net new customers who aren't aware of you. 
You can use social to take potential customers and drive them deeper in the purchase funnel to take people who are aware of you uh, and get them to actually give you money. That's what Agora Pulse is doing in this particular circumstance. You can use social primarily as a tool to deepen relationships with current customers to get yep. them to buy more and advocate on your ha on your behalf. You can use social media as a customer service mechanism to make your customer service more cost effective and, and faster, more responsive. Yep. All of those are viable. But most of the time, people don't actually know why they're in social media at all. Right. So I can't tell you whether you should do the new thing or the old thing without knowing what's the actual business case Yeah. for being really in good. social, period. Because maybe the answer is you shouldn't be in social media. Ooh. There's no law that says you have to do this. Look, was just talking to a brand the other day and uh, told me that they had they had disconnected as a test all of their posting on social media. They are no longer posting anything anywhere, okay? Uh, blogging, yes, and YouTube, yes. Mm -hmm. But no, not posting anywhere. No net impact on ROI, at least in the first 30 mm -hmm. days. No net mm -hmm. impact on, on ROI. And I found that incredibly interesting and yet sort of a relief to know that you don't need to post so much, right? It's not it yeah. like we get into this game of like, you have to do this. You have to do this because it's like the culture of social media. It, it becomes more like keeping up with your colleagues, right? Yes. And, oh, yes. this guy did this cool thing and, and I want to do this cool thing, but is it actually generating a result that's going to get you where you need to go? That's a very interesting point. And that's what I want to talk about next is sort of the business side of, of all of this. And how do we take what we're learning and implement it into a, a way that's that's feasible for a business? Jay, you've built a ton of businesses. You've helped other companies build their social media side. So I want to get into that in just one second, but I want to give a big shout out first to Daniel Gerloff, who says, says uh, that helps me so much finding the platforms that work and then focusing on the ones that work. Love to see those breakthroughs. Elicio is saying, hiring young influencers to go on that platform and inadvertently make content for the product. Obviously a great way to go if you've got the budget and the time to manage all that. Chris Michaels will logging in. Katie Miller, where the heck you been, Katie? We were holding the show, folks. We can finally get started because Katie Miller has joined us along with Carrie Ree. So glad to have you here. Naomi Nakashima saying so many times she's taken on too many projects. I love that you guys are out there and love that you're paying attention. What are you seeing happening in social media? Where is the big trend from your perspective? I want to hear from you in the comment section as we continue our conversation with the man, the myth, the legend, Jay Bear. You know, Jay, I was in um, one of the Carolinas. Chris Michaels, where was I? I was in one of the Carolinas and they both have a Greenville, okay? So I call my buddy and I say, hey, come meet me in Greenville. And uh, he starts driving and he goes, hey, drop a pin because I should be close. So I drop a pin. He says, bro, you're like five hours away. <laughs> and so I was in the wrong it's Carolina. It's the two Greenville problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, you're, you're, probably not, you're probably not the only person that's ever happened to. I love it. We're like these guys in this in the in the in like the lounge with <laughs> travel Carolina problems, my good man. You know, with whiskey, I love it. <laughs> but you know, I'm in this trip in the Carolinas, and I'm with my good buddy uh, Chuck, who who is a speaker. He's an NSA guy, and he has this great product. He does like um, uh, like video books, like an audio book, but it's a video book, and it's a really great thing. And and we're we're talking about success in the industry, and I said, well, I was talking to my friend. I'm not sure if you know him, a guy named Jay Bear, and he he looks over at me and he's like everybody knows Jay Bear, right? <laughs> and, you know, I've known you for years. I've known you, like, since I started, I think Sebastian Rusk uh, first introduced yeah. us, maybe at Social yeah, Fresh. Yeah. Right, yeah, exactly, years ago. And um, and it, we so much has happened uh, since then. But what's it like to be sort of a celebrity, right? You're more than just a, like a CEO business owner. You're sort of like the guy people come to see. You're the keynote speaker. What does that do for you on a personal level uh, and how it affects the way that you build your business, managing a personal brand, managing a business and doing all these different things? Uh, well, thanks. That's that's nice for you to say. Um, I, I hope it uh, impacts me as little as possible. Right. right. Because, you know, the, the, the time that I think I'm actually um, 
uh, a big deal is the time that I am officially doomed uh, because it, it really doesn't um, it really doesn't matter. I am I am modestly well known by a microscopically sized group of people. Yeah. Uh, so so I, I tend to I tend to try to not take that too terribly seriously. Right. That being said, obviously it's um, terrific to to have had um, some measure of notoriety for the work that I've done at Convince and Convert in books and on stage and my podcast, Social Pros, etc. Um, that's that's spectacular. Obviously, it helps from a business development standpoint. At, at Convince and Convert, a number of our uh, corporate clients have have uh, you know read books that I've written or 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 seen me speak or been a guest on my podcast or any number of other things that we do from sort of a inbound marketing content creation thought leadership perspective. I mean, we're not a huge company. Uh, there's you know 14 of us uh, or so at Convince and Convert, uh, but we we put out as many of you probably know a tremendous amount of content. We oh, yeah. very much much above our weight class considering the size uh, of the organization for a couple that. of reasons one that's how we get clients and two um we want to know what works because people ask us what works and so we have to have some measure uh of of experience there but it is really interesting to, to think back you know when i started convince and convert which was 11 years ago now almost 12 years um it was me uh, i'd already sold a, a previous consulting firm but when i started this company it was just me in my spare bedroom uh, and I was writing four blog posts a week wow. and commenting on other people's blogs when that was still a thing that people did. Okay. Uh, and 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 sending out um, a, a theoretically smart tweet once in a while. Uh, and that was kind of what we did. And that was sort of the only expectation I had. And now you fast forward a decade and it's kind of a whole thing, um, which is which is fun. Now, I will tell you about the speaking side of it. Uh, you know, of all the things that I do, podcast and writing and consulting, and all that speaking is my favorite. And I'll tell you okay. why. Uh, I'm not ashamed to admit it. Um, nobody ever gives standing ovations when you're delivering a strategic plan in a conference room. Uh, I, I, have, I have done a lot of strategic plans and a lot of meetings in a conference room and nobody ever stands up. It's like, man, that's the best strategy <laughs> yeah, ever. Yeah. Right? Incredible, right? Uh, Without being removed, they're like, Harvey, get out of here. Harvey's been drinking yeah. again. Get it. You know? Exactly. So look, there's two kinds of people in the world, right? Yeah. Uh, there's people who 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 um, who thrive on the energy of others and sort of suck energy out of crowds. Yeah. And there are people who are the opposite, who who crowds diminish their energy, which is like my wife, for example, she's an introvert. Right. So for me, I feed off crowd energy, which is why when I'm on stage, that's when I am literally at my best because all of those people, whether it's a hundred or ten thousand. I am taking little molecules of energy from them and putting it in myself and hopefully delivering a better performance. So that's the the part that I that I like the best is speaking. But that was never the original plan, Owen. So uh, about seven years ago, uh, I started to do more and more speaking after I wrote my first book, The Now Revolution. And I'm like, I really like this. And so we actually wrote a strategic plan wow. at Convince and Convert for me to go from uh, a consultant who does some speaking on occasion to a professional speaker who owns the world's best digital marketing consulting firm. And, and that took a number of years to kind of flip that 180 degrees yeah. um, to the degree that, that now one of our great successes is uh, last year at Content Marketing World, an event I, I know you're familiar with, yeah. uh, five of my strategy people were, were speakers at that event, five. Wow. Right. We only have seven strategists. Right. So so, you know, the, the amount of, of thought leadership and and excellence in our team is extraordinary to the degree that now when clients hire convince and convert to deliver something, they 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 don't expect Jay to do it. Um, yeah, and I, I still so look at everything before it goes out the door that's and I still so look at it. I supervise it. I make sure quality is there. But but when they hire convince and convert, they understand that there's a bunch of other people who are who are smarter than than I am at these kind of things. Uh, and, and that took a number of years to kind of build, convince and convert into a brand that, that runs sidecar to, to my personal brand. But operationally, to your original point, it's still a problem, man. Like we have a great, 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 <laughs> incredible community manager, Kristen Cardos Tink, who's yeah. one of the best community managers in the world in my estimation. I know her well. And those of you who, who know her, I think will acknowledge that to be true. She is truly extraordinary. So we have her, we work with Content 10X, we have Agora Pulse, we have a lot of tools and resources. But even today, uh, I, I struggle on an hourly basis on, hey, here's a thing I think I should say. 
Should that be on? Should that be on my account? Should it be on the convince a convert account? Yes. Which yes. of my account should it be on? You know, I still don't have it figured out. So yeah. um, it's it, it because partially, partially, I just don't know, and I'm not as good at it as you might think. And 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 partially, it changes, right? So what I would have put on Facebook is different today than than when the number of people who I was connected to on Facebook was smaller and more intimate, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know, man. It, it's, uh, I'll tell you one thing I'm going to do someday. I'm going to be out of this business yeah. And, and I will not be one of those guys who sort of, um, retires or semi retires, but keeps up his social media presence. Right. I'm going dark, baby. Like, yeah. It will be what happened to that guy Jay? I, and I will literally disconnect all of it because it actually creates it. a lot of anxiety for me. I, you know, I can imagine, um, just having been in, in the space myself and, you know, you're constantly in this battle of like, oh, here's an idea and like, oh, we should tell that story. And it's like, you know, with what existing resources, like the team is already working to the nines, you know, like we've already, we're already stretched, um, as far as it can go. And then on which, you know, on which platform is this like an IG thing or, or, and sometimes we're kind of guilty of putting like what, what should have gone on LinkedIn, you know, kind of ended up on, on Facebook and it's like, oh, I get it. Like that was way too businessy and it should have been more personal. And I just sort of want it to end. You know, and that's why I enjoy following your content on Instagram because I get to see some of the lake house and, you know, some of the fruits of your labor, you know, and it's like, okay, okay, good. Yeah, that's where I do more of the personal stuff now is on, right. is on Instagram stories uh, mostly um, and, and Facebook stories too. I'll tell you how I'm trying to, how I'm trying to solve for that though, yeah. um, Owen, and this is actually the topic of my, my um, uh, presentation on Tuesday at Social Media Marketing World in San Diego. I'm sure some folks are going to be there for that. Um, we we teach this to our clients at Convince and Convert, and I use it for myself now, is, is this notion that the worst thing you can do today is engage in random acts of social. Oh, it just, it, number one, doesn't work, uh, and it doesn't give your audience anything to sort of know you by or tune into. Right. So almost all of what I do with social now um, is is shows, right? And so we have three different of shows, right? You've got kind of binge-worthy episodic shows. Love this. You've got kind of one-time specials. Yes. And, and then kind of ongoing news and updates. So thinking like a television network is the paradigm yes. that we use. And I know that's familiar to you as well. That, that idea of, all right, like you've got three different types of programs, plot those into an editorial calendar, have one editorial calendar for LinkedIn, one for Instagram, one for Twitter, one for Facebook, et cetera. That thinking really helps me stay more organized since it's been really useful for our clients. And I'm going to teach that methodology on Tuesday uh, in San Diego. That's great. I can't wait to see that. You know, that is the platform that we move forward with as far as YouTube creation as well. You know, you've got to think about the show, even if that show is like an Instagram, you know, tip, right? Like, and I'm just being really generic here, but like, if your your show is on Mondays, uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays on Instagram, you're going to post a tip and it's going to have this look and feel and have this theme to it. But it's recurring, it's episodic, that's it's it. hooky, right? It brings people in and it gives them something to to think about. And that's what I want to ask you about, Jay. Like uh, for business or for pleasure, who are you searching out on social? What are you looking at? Are there, are, is it entrepreneur.com, inc.com? Are you like watching Bassmasters and something completely, you know, out of the realm? Where, where do you look to go on social media? <laughs> Not so much Bassmasters, although I make a note on that. Um, it's a ghost so, so it's kind of a combination of things. Yeah. Yeah. It's impressive. Uh, it's a combination of things. So obviously there's a, a lot of um, social media leaders and, and, uh, in Interesting uh, in the category, including yourself, who who I follow very closely to see what they're doing, what they're launching next. Um, I also follow a lot of industry publications, both um, kind of your your core industry pub publications like the Gorpol Social Media Lab and Social Media Examiner, or the work that we do at Convince and Convert, etc., yeah. etc., etc. Um, but but also um, contemporary business uh, publications, uh, whether it's uh, Bloomberg, Inc., CMO.com. I'm always looking to see what social media news kind of um, makes the leap into the popularized business press. Yeah. Because the reason I do that is once it makes the leap, then I know my clients are going to start calling. 
Yeah. Um, you know, that that's when I know it's a big enough thing that that people who don't do social media every day, who might be directors of digital, VP digital, CMOs, now they're gonna start reading it and they're right. gonna start asking me about it. So that's kind of an early warning detection system for me. That's cool. Uh, is to pay attention to kind of the popularized business uh, press. And then lately I've been spending a lot of time uh, just sort of following for a while, then, then unfollowing and then following different ones. A lot of DTC brands, a lot of these uh, newer product-based companies that are using Instagram, Snap, TikTok um, to to create and launch uh, and and market and sell products. I think that is a really uh, it's a massively fast growing part of the category. Yeah. They're also typically pretty good uh, in many cases at influencer marketing. We do a lot of B two B influencer programs, right? Uh, at Commit to Convert, so it's nice to see what those guys uh, are doing as well. I watch yoga videos, and I I, I find that nice. my answer you're, was you're, you're bendy like that. I feel your answer was so much better than mine, but uh, I love that you're in the space and that you're 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 looking at what everybody else is is doing, and that kind of leads us up to our big question today: is um, we 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 tune into the shows and we find out what's trending. You're reading, you know, these different articles and you're finding out what's happening and what's about to happen, and that's all well and good. But how do we really capitalize on what's trending, right? I'd love to hear from you and maybe a, a variety of ideations here. You know, like. Do you do you take what's trending and write about it? Do you try to create a platform on it? Do you educate to it? And obviously, it's different if you're a plant company like selling plants versus a social media marketing company. So let's talk about a social media marketing yeah. company, right? You're a social media manager. Like, how do we sure. capture that and and use it to grow our business? Yeah, it's a it's a super great question and and important. I think for everybody to to think this through. I'll, I'll tell you just as a as a personal note that's how this started right so yeah. you talked about hey you know um sort of the 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 career path for me when it was just me in a bedroom writing blog posts um that's why hot. would anybody come to my blog why would they come to to convert so what i did was and again this is back in the days when subscribing to blogs via rss readers right and then commenting on blogs was, was a huge thing we didn't comment in facebook people weren't even on facebook for that matter um so what i would do is I would get up at four in the morning every morning because uh, I was on East Coast uh, uh, time. No, I was That's actually huge. West Coast time at that point. Uh, and so East Coast East Coast would be published early. Uh, so I was still in Arizona. So I'd get up early and I would I would look and see on Twitter because that was the only option at that point what all the, the news was that was trending, post trending topics in social media, digital marketing, email marketing, etc. I would pick out two or three. I would think about, okay, what do I, what, what is my take on this story? Yeah. Uh, and then I would go find all the blogs that were writing about it. Hmm. And I would leave long detailed, presumably thoughtful comments um, about that, about that issue. And then eventually people started to think, wow, that's a pretty good comment. I wonder what his blog is like. So literally I got my start doing exactly what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Which is, which is figuring out what the news was reacting to it quickly. Uh, and and trying to add value, right? Yeah. And I and I did that from from 4 a.m. until 8 a.m. six days a week for two years. Wow, every day. I love that. Just by myself. I right? love that. And, and, and I, um and it, go ahead. And I love that you woke up early to do it, right? I feel like in the social media space there is this um, sort of uh, glorification of up all night culture, and like that to me was a college thing, right? But successful people that I read and follow, they talk about morning routines and morning rituals and getting up early. Mark Wahlberg gets up at like 3.30 in the morning um, uh, to, to start his routine. You're talking about 4.30 yep. in the morning. I just bumped it up to five. Yeah, I mean, five I, you know, it's not like I'm, it's not like I'm, it's not like I'm like, you know, it's not like I'm all about the hustle or whatever. That's not really my jam. I, right. I kind of feel like that's an overplayed uh, narrative, but I lived in Arizona. So half the year I was on West coast time. Yeah. A lot of the top bloggers were on East coast time. So I'm living on a three hour penalty from the jump. Right. So, Boom. you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like, let me out grind everybody. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, it wasn't a rise and grind thing. Yeah. It was, if I don't, if I'm in this time zone. This is just the way it is. Now I'm on East coast time and I'm not doing shit. Shit, yeah, I'll tell you that. You know, it's not a, it's not a statement of values. It was just, hey, that's how it has to be. You know. Yeah, yeah, I get it. And you're three hours ahead of those uh, of everyone else, and so you get to have, you get to have that luxury. You know what? Talk to me about that. Yeah, I was in Australia last week. I was a day and a half ahead of everybody. 
Yeah, drinking margaritas, be like, I'm blog writing at the speed of sound, bitches. You know, like that's that's just how that's just how we'll it read goes. this tomorrow. <laughs> when you're in yeah. Australia, no one's in a rush. Look, uh, that's an interesting point about hustle culture. Hustle culture gave me cancer. Uh, there's no doubt about it, right in my mind, at least. Um, the scientists say it was electric wires, but whatever. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know, do, hustling day and night, not sleeping, top ramen, all those things, like, eventually exploded into a tumor in my chest. Uh, but at the same time, we're, like, scrambling. We're all scrambling, like, stay on top of the trends, stay on top of the news. How do we differentiate between, like, hustle and productivity, right? And what are some of the softwares or the systems yeah. that you've used? Because I know you, you create content like a machine. Like, what have been the big wins for you in, like, being productive and stepping out of that hustle culture? I mean, I think the, 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 the real question there is, well, let me say it this way. The problem I have with hustle is not hard work. I, I, I do work hard. I think a lot of people um, notice yes. that and acknowledge it. But a lot of times I think that the, the notion of hustle is just a disguise for not understanding opportunity cost. Okay. Right. So That's so big. if I'm always hustling, it doesn't matter whether the thing that I'm doing at any given moment actually adds value because I'm out there doing stuff. Right. Yeah. And let me say this in a neater way. We, we talk to our clients about this a lot. Um, activity isn't a success metric. Yeah. Right. Like 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 making more content isn't a KPI yeah. ever. Good. Ever. Right. The, the best possible the best possible situation is you write one blog post that's so good it creates customers for you forever. Wow. That's the goal. The yes. goal isn't to write as many blog posts as you can. Yeah. The goal is to write the best blog post that you never have to write a second one. Am I, right? am I and that church? literally is, is the exact opposite of the hustle. Right. That's the exact opposite of the hustle culture. The hustle yeah. culture, in my estimation, tends to prioritize activity yes. uh, in front of results. And that doesn't actually make any sense. Right. It right. doesn't make any sense in life or in business. Um, so, so I think the, the, the best way to, to solve for that, in my estimation, is to, is to hold yourself accountable for making sure you put some kind of success metric around all the things that you do, whether mm -hmm. it's a, a content consumption metric, a, a, a lead gen metric, a, a backlinks acquisition metric, or perhaps most importantly, Owen, an enjoyment metric, right? Like uh, one of my good friends, Rory Vaden, um, is, a, is a genius personal branding consultant and is in a mastermind with me. And he got up in my face about this a year ago. Yeah. And he said, hey, what if you changed your own personal scoreboard from from money fame success etc to just how much you enjoyed each and every day wow and what if you actually graded every day on a on a zero to five scale mm -hmm. like was this a five-star day a four-star day a three-star day a two-star right. day or a one-star day and and why and if you just make that daily report card uh, and you say this is how i'm going to live my life i'm going to try and maximize five-star days it's amazing how much your bigger goals or or your other goals your monetary goals your success goals uh, actually, uh, will, will fall into place. I think, you know, a lot of times we're just not, we're either not measuring at all or we're not measuring the right things. Yeah. Not measuring what matters. Uh, that's big. We're getting a lot of, uh, reactions on the Facebook live. Dustin W. Stout, Naomi Nakashima, Katie Miller, all the trues, the regulars are out there. If you haven't jumped in and left a comment, say hello in the comment section below. We'd love to hear from you. From uh, Jacob Sapochnik, David Barrett, Buffalo, Jerry Carrillo. Good to see you guys out there. Uh, with Jacob Sapochnik, one of my favorites. Yeah, I haven't seen him in a while. Haven't, I'm hoping to see him at uh, Social Media Marketing World. How many of you will be at Social Media Marketing World this week? Let me know. Type SMMW in the comment section down below. Uh, you know, Jay, so, so, much, uh, so much good stuff there. Uh, let's talk about the biggest challenges that social media managers face and how do we overcome it? What's the biggest challenge that you see from an on the ground standpoint? And how do we overcome that and get to at least a place of enjoying our days, right? Because I see so many of us social media managers, even though I'm not really doing that now, I've done it. Um, and we're working our fingers to the yeah. bone. We're getting trampled on um, like Hank Hill selling propane. Like people are just walking all over us. And Yes, sir. No, sir. Um, you, you know, what's the biggest challenge there? How do we overcome it? So it, we're at least in a place of fluid creation and enjoying our, our work. And please keep your answer to under 30 seconds. No, I'm, uh, I'm kidding. How do you are answer that in 30 seconds? 
No, you're you're a hundred percent correct. Uh, in fact, I'm going to put a, a a link in the chat here on the Facebook Live uh, to a podcast episode cool. we recorded um, not too long ago with Lori uh, Lori Bird, um, and it's all about social media manager burnout and, and oh, yeah. how it's totally real and and how people are are working themselves um, to exhaustion and and beyond because they feel like they've got to do everything and be everywhere uh, and and solve every problem and. Uh, as we talked about somewhat earlier in today's show, a lot of managers don't really under squires. Um, they, yeah. they just they just don't, right? And so yeah. they're like, yeah, just you know, do all day Sunday, make sure that gets handled, right? Um, oh my gosh, it's, yeah. it's it's a real challenge. Um, and I'll tell you this: it's, if I were a social media manager, I would be looking to do something else because this ain't going to get any easier. It's wow. only going to get harder. It's only going to get more fractured. It's only going to get more algorithmically driven. The competition is only going to go up. Um, all the things that bother us now are not going to get better. And I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Um, but unless you truly love this to the degree that you can't imagine doing any other job, yeah. uh, I would say in my organization, how can I maybe use the social media role to to be a launch pad in some other role um, that that I like just as much, if not more, and doesn't require the same kind of all in commitment that the social media role requires. I don't think it's a great job. Uh, I really don't. My daughter is a social media manager in college uh, and, and has realized through a series of internships just how hard it is. Yeah. Uh, and now she's going to law school and wants to be influencer marketing attorney, which I think is really interesting. Good. That's great. Um, it's just a tough gig, right? And you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, and I, and I think it's going to be one of those jobs for a lot of people where you do it for two years and you're like, all right, I've had enough. Um, I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go do something, something different. Yeah. Matthew Rouse is calling you the bear of bad news. I like that. I like that. <laughs> well, you know, when, I, I think uh, I'm old enough now that, uh, that, that I'm, I'm old enough now that I don't care if I'm a wet blanket, right? It's like, hey, I don't need to, I don't need to, uh, to, to cheerlead this deal anymore. Well, and I think that people want to hear um, the real, the real ish too, because uh, from the comments, Dustin Stout, Brad Friedman, Naomi Nakashima, Kerry Re, uh, everyone is saying like, I pivoted, I pivoted, I pivoted for that exact, exact same reason, and it's, it's all becoming so automated that social media, you know, isn't the career. Right. The, the career is the changing lives. The career is the moving product. The career is in building audiences. Right. That's the career. And social media is becoming more and more of of a utility in um, in that function. Jay, before we go today, I wanted to ask you for five of your favorite things. It's a new segment we're calling Jay's favorites. Oh, we're going to wrap up our show. I want to oh, hear you. five very um, important, very gra groundbreaking uh, questions here, folks, that are going to give you some insight okay. into the mind of Jay Bear. Jay, first question for you: What is your oh, favorite movie? Okay. I'm, not just, I'm not just naming. I'm not just naming five things. You're asking me questions. Yes, I'm going to ask you questions that are deeply, deeply personal okay. and shocking. I think to the rest of the okay, world. Great. Starting with my favorite, my favorite question: What is your favorite movie of all time? Uh, Spinal Tap. Spinal Tap. <laughs> uh, Christopher Guest wrote that, didn't he? Absolutely. The original rockumentary, uh, uh, fine line between stupid and clever, so uh, and a number you, of other fantastic lines. If you've not you, seen this is spinal tap, go watch. Are you into like that? Do you generally like that, that genre? Like the, um, uh, the best in show Absolutely. was hilarious. Yeah. Best, best show, so yes, best in show fan. is one of those that if it's on wherever it's on, I, I turn it on. And, and for those of you guys in the audience that don't know the six fingered man, um, uh, no, 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 no. Christopher Guest killed, like, wanted to kill the six-fingered man. He was Count Reuben in The Princess Bride, and he wrote these amazing sort of satirical shows. Spinal Tap was uh, one of them. That's good. I, that, that's, so I'm glad to know I can drop some of those lines at you, Jay. That's, uh, that's good stuff. Okay, question number two. Uh, favorite song of all time. What's your favorite song of all time? Favorite song of all time because it is uh, so rooted to my high school years would be uh, How Soon Is Now by The Smiths. How soon? Oh, wow. Good. The Smiths. That's a cool answer. I was, I was sort of assuming more of I like mean, I a... Was a, I, I was a... I was an indie rock guy. I started the radio station at my college and no. uh, went to the first uh, 
the first the first three South by Southwest when it was only music uh, and and only only rock. And so so I was uh, I was in that world uh, a long time ago. I love it. I love to hear that. I was you know I was a radio guy from like the early days. Uh, in fact, it was being fired from a radio station. I was walking out with my box of stuff. You know, going like I'm gonna make it on YouTube. And 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 sure enough, I was able to stumble into some sex, some success there. <laughs> well done. So yeah, thanks. I actually tripped. I dropped everything and I had 10,000 subs. It was beautiful. All right. So, okay. So let's talk about business. Who is your favorite business leader to like sort of look at and follow someone that you look at and you go, man, that Ooh. guy's really got it together. That's uh, that's a, a real challenge. I'm super fortunate to, um, to have been able to spend the time with a, a lot of folks that kind of fit that description. I, I guess I will say, um, I guess I will say Seth Godin because he tends to every um, couple of years come up with something else that is only tangentiated to what he has talked about before. Right. So typically in business in business authors and speakers, you have people who, who continue to mine a, a sort of one vein of quartz, right? So they write a book about customer service and then another book about customer service and then a third right. book about customer service and 17th book about customer service. And they always write and talk about customer service, different dimensions. Seth tends to, to cover a much broader range of topics. And I've sort of tried to model my career in that regard where I've got a book about content marketing, a book about customer service, a book about word of mouth, a new one will be about customer experience. I've got one about social business. And so I, I try to kind of do that same thing, much less successfully, uh, is, <sighs> is not get uh, roped into one particular uh, topic. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Um, are you listening, Robert Kiyosaki? I mean, geez, like Rich Dad, Rich Dad's <laughs> Guide to Senior Citizenry. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, I I'm, really not love... it, I'm not saying it won't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. I wish <laughs> I had that kind of focus. You know, I can't keep my mind on one thing at a time. Okay, great. Seth Godin, favorite business leader. What is your favorite memory, Jay Bear? What's your favorite memory? Takes you back, something you love. You can always go back on it on on a on a stormy winter's night. Uh, what's your favorite uh, What's your favorite memory? Yeah, I, I see. Uh, uh, Kristen Cardos is in the in the chat now. Uh, our community manager and good friend who has heard me tell uh, many many stories, um, uh, fueled by many many cocktails, and, and so this could be a nine hour live show um, of, of just I could use the watch that time. Happened, uh, yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, man, I don't know. This, this is like literally impossible. I'll just, um, first one that, that I think of off the top of my head, just because yeah. I was thinking about him this morning, uh, my, my, uh, my late, uh, little brother and I, uh, did not get along, uh, great, uh, ever. We were sort of at that age where just close enough, but far enough apart. Sure. And, uh, and we were having Thanksgiving one year. I think I was probably seven and he was four. Uh, and we had friends over and everything. Uh, and as my as my uh, parents were preparing Thanksgiving, we were out in the yard messing around. My mom looks out the window, and we are in uh, locked in combat in a rake versus hoe fight. Wow! So I had the oh, hoe, he had the rake, and we were like full on jousting, swinging them. And we both <laughs> both came in the house bleeding. Uh, Happy Thanksgiving! So, oh yeah, my goodness good gracious! Yeah, I'm a uh, I'm a boy dad. I've got three boys and uh, a little princess girl. And let me tell you, they come in. They'll be like running with scissors, you know, big smiles on their face, blood dripping down. It's like, a metaphor. That's a real thing. yeah, yeah, no, it's yeah, exactly. It's a real thing. Like JJ, JJ hasn't, hasn't even gotten up yet, you know, and now I'm like running over to the neighbor's house and, and that thing. Okay. That's really sweet. Jay, thanks for sharing that with us. All right. Sure. Big one. Now this is the one that I was like stewing over all night. We're going to go deep inside your psyche right now. What is your favorite TV show right now? Netflix, Hulu, Prime. What are you binge watching, Jay? Oh man, um, BoJack Horseman um, is is probably my favorite currently. Uh, it is it is a, a Netflix uh, show, animated. As many people know, just finished up its concluding season. Uh, it is an extraordinary mixture of of hilarious and really really poignant. Um, work on on depression and the human condition wow. and and it really resonates in a lot of different ways I, I think it is one of the most extraordinary uh tv shows ever ever developed 
criminally underrated and underrecognized in my estimation. Uh, it's it's really terrific. Uh, the other one I just finished, um, and uh, uh, it's it's terrific. Having grown up in Arizona. I really like this one is uh, I really like Narcos season two. It was terrific. I like the Narcos Mexico arc. It's awesome. And my wife and I are just right now in the middle of on HBO, uh, the documentary on McMillions, which is oh, yeah. the, Monopoly, the Monopoly game uh, scandal, which is hilarious and amazing and a okay. really, really great documentary. Also, uh, it's fascinating. Uh, it's a good one. Also, they've got an associated podcast. It's like in the top 20 podcast right now. Is the is it really? Yeah, I, I saw they had a podcast. I, I, I need to check that out and see uh, how, how that kind of tracks against uh, against the show. I, I, I noticed that somewhere and I thought it was kind of interesting. There's there's an Office uh, podcast too. It's called Office Ladies. And uh, like uh, Pam and uh, D Dwight's girlfriend, I call her oh, from the Oh, from the show. From the from show, the show yeah. yeah. And they like rewatch and react to old Office, office oh, episodes. Awesome. And I'm seeing this trend of like uh, the like the the program on on streaming and then the accompanying podcast, which I think is is kind of cool. Reminds me of those so books you, you had as a kid, and like you'd put like the little record in the fake record player, and it would like tell you ding to turn the, the panel of the the, the page of, <laughs> right. of the book. You know, exactly. you may now watch the next episode of McMillions. You know, you can move on. Yeah. Uh, Jay, you're doing phenomenal work. Thanks for spending time with us today. Where Thanks, do we buddy. go to follow you and your latest projects? Uh, I'm not hard to find. A uh, few places can go. Convinceandconvert.com is our primary online destination. More than 3,000 uh, free articles for social media marketers, content marketers, uh, and related. My podcast is Social Pros, the largest podcast in the world for big company social media managers, socialpros.com, or wherever you get your audio. Uh, main site for me is jbear.com, and my new podcast, uh, which is actually growing by leaps and bounds. It's called Standing Ovation, a weekly show where I interview a professional speaker about how they developed and polished their signature story on stage. Go check out Standing Ovation on podcasts everywhere. Are you putting that on video at all, Jay? Standing Ovation? Uh, Standing Ovation is not on video. Social Pros uh, is. Um, but standing ovation uh, at present is not. But uh, we'll such, talk about that tomorrow. Such, because guess who's going to be on my show this week? Owen Video, baby. That's right. Owen I'm going to be on the Social Pros podcast. <laughs> uh, talking with Jay about YouTube and what's working for YouTube. So, guys, go download the podcast, Social Pros. Download standing ovation and become a part of the Jay Bear Revolution. Jay, Jay, thanks so much for being here today. And thank you, all of us watching on Facebook and on YouTube. Don't forget to join us in two weeks as the social media lab continues. See you then. Bye, guys. Thank you for watching the social media lab brought to you by Agoraphone. <laughs> where we use science to crack the social media code. Join us live on Facebook and YouTube to find out what's working and what's not working in social media.